Uh, Luke 23 is where we're going to be. Turn your Bibles, if you would, there. And um, we are on our way to the cross, which doesn't sound exciting. It doesn't sound uh, wonderful. It's not. But how the cross impacts and affects our, li- our lives is, is amazing. Um, before we get there, you ever, uh, you ever head to a destination and then realize once you get there, you're in the wrong place? You ever, you ever get on the wrong bus to the wrong destination? Um, so one of the great stories that come out of the Olympics, have we already forgot about the Olympics? Come on, you guys. There's still stories. There's still stories to be told. So, uh, and like I said, there, there, are, there are few worse feelings than realizing too late that you've gotten on the wrong bus, you've arrived at the wrong destination. It must feel worse that when that bus is supposed to be taking you to your Olympic semifinal event, which is what happened to the Jamaican hurdler Hansley Parchment, who ended up at the Tokyo Aquatics Arena instead of the track. So he ends up at the Aquatics Arena. A volunteer says, you're in the wrong place, gives him cab money to go across town to the right location just in time to get on the track and win the gold. Is that awesome or what? Right after he wins the gold, he goes back to pay back the volunteer that gave him the money with his gold medal in hand. Is that awesome or what? See, guys, I think today is a time when I'm going to be hopefully instrumental in your life in maybe sharing with some of you you're heading to the wrong destination. Uh, I I don't want repayment. But what I want you to do is I want you to realize that so many people journey through life and they end up in a location that they don't want to be at. Today is the morning where God is going to hopefully get our attention and hopefully get us to the right destination. And the right destination is what? To his heart. It's a relationship with him. It's the fact that we're, we're all like sheep, lost, we've gone astray. And yet the good shepherd comes and says, you need to come to me. How many people are wayward these days? How many people are wandering these days? How many people are lost these days? How many people will, once they pass from this life to the next, realize they're on the wrong road? Today is the day to get to the right destination. Today is the day of salvation. This is what the cross of Jesus is all about. Matter of fact, uh, the cross is the greatest demonstration of God's love for us. And in the cross of Christ, we have the greatest display of grace ever. Write down that word grace. If you've never heard grace defined this way, you're going to love it. Grace is defined this way. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. You ever heard that before? That's awesome. God pays the tab for you to know his riches because he knows you could never pay the tab yourselves. That's grace. And today we get to look at the cross. Tomorrow, uh, Next week we get to look at the cross as well. And we need to stop and consider the weightiness of what actually transpired on that hill called the skull some 2,000 years ago. Martin Luther, father of the, of the Reformation, said this, and I love how he, he, he frames these words. All the prophets foresaw on that cross Jesus becoming the greatest murderer, adulterer, thief, rebel, and blasphemer that there ever was. Our most merciful father sent only his son into the world and said to him, Jesus, you will become Peter the denier. Jesus, you will become Paul that persecutor. Jesus, you will become the blasphemer, cruel oppressor. You will become David that adulterer. You will become Adam that sinner which did eat the apple in paradise. You will become those things. And not only that, I'm thinking about the fact that Jesus becomes the husband who has neglected and abused his family. Jesus becomes that person. He becomes the immoral woman who has destroyed not only her life, but seemingly everyone who has come in contact with her. He becomes the drug addict. He becomes the teenage girl who lies to her parents. He becomes the teen boy who's introduced to pornographer. He becomes the hypocrite that lives a double life. He becomes the proud, the selfish, the apathetic. He becomes those things for us. 
No one can sit and say God loves us at a distance. He loves, he loves us in our messiness so much so that he became sin for us. He who knew no sin becomes sin for you and me. This is the, the remarkable, mind-blowing truth about the, the cross of Christ. It's, it's humbling. It's sobering. I love how C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, describes the scene of the cross. He says, God who needs nothing loves into existence holy superfluous creatures in order that he may love and perfect them. He creates the universe already foreseen, or should we say seen, there are no tenses in God. The buzzing cloud of flies about the cross, the flayed back pressed against the uneven stake, the nails driven through the medial nerves, the repeated incipient suffocation as the body droops, the repeated torture of back and arms that is time after time for breath's sake hitched up. Notice this, if I may dare the biological image, God is a host who deliberately creates his own parasites, causes us to be that we may exploit and take advantage of him. Herein is love. This is the diagram of love, himself the inventor of all loves. We would probably need the rest of today just to dissect this. But what Lewis is getting at is the fact that the cross is the greatest evidence of God's love for us, becoming for us what we can never become for ourselves. The perfect righteous substitute. The fact that God would take our sins upon himself. Wow. My prayer is that the message today would remind us of God's grace and that the message today of God's grace would would humble us. That perhaps by the end of today, you would know you're on the right, the right bus, heading to the right destination. This, this, this means nothing if it's just an exercise and going to church and hearing some good music, drinking some cool coffee and, and talking to wonderful people. What lies in the balance is eternity. And we're going to meet some different people along the way to the cross today. So turn your Bibles to Luke 23. We're going to examine some scenes that maybe in the past we've just kind of rushed over, glossed over, quickly passed through. But I think every connection Jesus makes, every interaction Jesus makes on his way to the cross and then once he's at the cross is, is significant. Every, every, every encounter is significant. And so we turn to Luke 23. We start at verse 26. So the trials have taken place. He's declared innocent, but yet Pilate will crucify him to satisfy the, the mob. Verse 26, Luke 23. And when they had led him away, they laid hold of one Simon of Cyrene. He was visiting for the Passover celebration some 800 miles from home. Cy Cyrene was a coastal city in Africa. He came 800 miles to celebrate Passover. And all of a sudden, they grab him. They compel him. That's what the, the gospel of, of Mark says. They compel him to do what? To place on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. He didn't come for this task. Matter of fact, he was probably heading the other direction. When all of a sudden, God interceded and interfered his life and turned him towards, towards the hill. There were following him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him, which was custom. These weren't the, the close friends of Jesus who were the women. These were just general women who, when crucifixion happened, would be a part of the mourning party. Some of them were professional mourners. Others were just women that were just lending assistance along the way. But Jesus turned to those women and said these words, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. They will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what will happen in the dry? 
And two others also who were criminals were being led away to put to death with him. So there's three people that day marked for crucifixion. They're all heading towards the same direction. Two unnamed criminals. And when they came to the place called the Skull, Calvary, they were crucified together. Crucified him with the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. Jesus is right there in the middle. But Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. They're casting lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him. The rulers couldn't stop sneering and mocking and insulting. First Peter 2 says, when he was being reviled at, he didn't revile in return. I'm one of those guys, I would love to revile in return. I would love to trade insult for insult, but this is why I'm not Jesus and I need him desperately. So the rulers are sneering at him. They're saying he saved others, which was true, yet they didn't let that truth sink into their hearts, right? Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers are there. They're also mocking him. They've already been beating him up all night. Remember that? Clothing him in a purple robe, pressing the crown of thorns into his head, whipping him to the point where his, his back is bleeding. Isaiah says his face pummeled to the point that you don't even recognize him. They're offering him sour wine. It's almost like an anesthetic. Saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, there was also an inscription above his head that said, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanging there hurling abuse at him. Now, you need to know both criminals at the start of this were, were hurling insults. But one stops hurling insults while the other one continues. The one who is insulting Jesus says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Like, dude, do something. But the other answered and rebuked his friend do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Scenes of grace, scenes of humility. First, we need to consider Simon the Cy from Cyrene. First point is this. There's a word for the compelled. Humiliation is guaranteed. Let me, let me just put this out there, and I'm going to ask you just to think about this. Without humiliation before God, there's no exaltation in God. There's, if there's no humiliation from God, there's no exaltation in God. Look at verse 26. They compel, they force a man from the crowd named Saint Simon from Cyrene, 800 miles away, to share to take the weight of the cross, this would be the crossbar called the patibulum, 100 pounds in weight. No reason, there's, there's reason to consider the fact that Jesus couldn't handle this weight considering what he's been through all night long. All of a sudden now, they bring out Simon by force, carry the cross. This is, this is an act of humiliation. Being forced to carry a condemned man's cross was an act of humiliation. They're traveling the road, and, and the Romans made sure it was the longest road you could take to the hill because they wanted everyone in that community to know that if you act against Rome, this could be your punishment. This, this was a, a, an act of deterrence. But Simon is now pressed into serving Christ against his will to carry the cross. I want you to know something, that this incident is transformative for Simon. Mark says 
when it comes to this account. Simon had two sons named Rufus and Alexander. I just like the name Rufus. That's a cool name. Rufus and Alexander. The reason Mark wants you to know that this is Simon, who's the father of these two boys, Rufus and Alexander, is because Simon is converted. Him and his family become pillars in the early church. Acts mentions them. Here is a Jewish man from Africa in town for the Passover who now gets pressed into service to carry the cross of Jesus. I wonder what happened on that road to the hill. I wonder what sort of uh, glances were perhaps exchanged from Jesus to Simon. I wonder if Simon started just with this reluctant look on his face, like, I don't want to be here. I want to be anywhere else but here. But the gaze and the stare of Jesus into his eyes changed him. Something happened. Something happened in this man's life where he came to town with religion and he leaves with relationship. He comes to town out of devotion and he leaves with salvation. Something remarkable happens in this man's life. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's two things. He comes to the cross of Christ first. And from this moment, he learns how to take up his own cro cross in daily living. This, this is what salvation looks like. There is no salvation apart from the cross of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. But there's no walking in a life honorable before God unless you learn what Jesus himself taught, take up your cross daily. How important is the cross? Well, the cross saves you. His cross, Jesus' cross, saves you. Your cross sanctifies you. Meaning as you walk in obedience, as you walk paying attention to, to, to your shepherd's voice, your savior's voice, your Lord's voice, you understand more and more every single day what taking up your cross looks like. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are moments of humiliation in that journey. Can I get an amen from somebody? I mean, think about the initial, like when you come to the cross of Christ, here's what you have to acknowledge. You are poor. You are naked. You are powerless. You need him. That's humiliating. This is why a lot of people don't set foot before the cross of Christ because they're too prideful to admit their need. But once you're humiliated before the cross of Christ, don't rule out moments of humiliation in your journey as you take up your cross to follow him. You never thought Simon of Cyrene could teach you such wonderful lessons, did you? The image is sobering. Because if we don't feel the weight of the cross, if there's no sacrifice, if there's no occasions of humiliation, we are not following Christ. No one said taking up your cross was easy. I mean, isn't this the one verse discipleship, right? Luke 9, 23. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. But I'm going to tell you right now, the humiliation that's aimed at Christ, as far as what we receive following him, leads to exaltation. Can I quote Lewis again? It's been a few weeks. I'm, I'm doubling up on Lewis today. Greatest book, 20th century, I believe, ever written, Mere Christianity. Look what Lewis says in, in, in the spirit of what I'm talking about. But the great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, his love for us does not. Amen. It is not wearied by our sins or our indifference and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured of those sins at whatever cost to us, at whatever cost to him. He continues, that is why he warned people to count the cost before becoming Christians. Make no mistake, he says, if you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you're in for. Nothing less or other than that. You have free will, and if you choose, you can push me away. But if you do not push me away, understand I'm going to see this job through. Whew. 
whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life, whatever inconceivable purification it may cost you after death, whatever it costs me, I will never rest, nor let you rest until you are literally perfect, until my Father can say without reservation that he is well pleased with you. And as he said, he is well pleased with me. This I can do and will do, but I will not do anything less. Praise God for his work. Because there are times I don't want him to work. <laughs> I don't want him to change me. I don't want him to transform me. But praise God for his relentless love toward us. Simon would tell us today, bear the cross. Because it's worth every single step. So as Simon and Jesus are walking toward the skull, Calvary, there's a group of women that are following. Point number two, for the criers, judgment is coming. For those who mourn, judgment is going to happen. See, much heavier than the cross, ladies and gentlemen, here's the reality, much heavier than the cross has to bear on, is the weight of God's judgment coming to those who don't love God. Let the cross not only be the weight, but let it break you, because if not, God's judgment will be much heavier than the cross. These women are coming along. And the scene is unique to Luke. I love how we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some of them choose to isolate certain scenes. This scene is unique to Luke. And here are these women, general group of women. These aren't the besties of Jesus, right? Not Mary, not Martha, not the prostitutes, right? This is a general group of women who would accompany all the criminals that would go to die that day. And they were there to lend of, to lend of assistance. And I'm going to tell you something just so cool about the ministry of Christ. No woman was ever an enemy of Jesus in the Gospels. And Jesus was never an enemy to any women in the Gospels. Can I get an amen, ladies? Amen. Jesus made sure women knew they had dignity and he elevated their status in a culture that would de demote them. Jesus is pro-woman. Yay! I love it. But they were probably surprised when this wretched prisoner on the verge of the most torturous death turns to them and shares a message with them. Now, I'm gonna, on his way to the cross, I am blown away by how much Jesus thinks about other people. Think about this. He does it with these women. He's going to do it with the soldiers. He's going to do it with the, the criminals. Like, he's thinking of others. He turns to the women, and what is his message? He says, don't cry for me, Argentina. I mean, don't cry for me. <laughs> Quoting Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah, I'm in with that crew. Not really, but. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Can, can I summarize? I'm going to summarize what Jesus says to these women in one sentence. I don't want your sympathy I want your repentance. These women are lost. They're doing a good thing. But they're doing it out of empty religion. Daughters of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, the whole nation of Israel. You love God with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Don't weep for me. I'm going to accomplish the Father's will. Don't weep for me. I'm going to accomplish salvation. Don't weep for me. I'm going to be a conqueror. Don't weep for me. Sunday's coming. Weep for yourselves who think that external religion makes up for internal lack. Weep for yourselves whom the prophets have come and you sent them away, oftentimes beating them up and even killing them. Weep for yourselves, for today is the day of salvation, because if you don't repent, judgment is coming, 80, 70 Romans coming in and destroying Jerusalem completely. The tree is green now. But 
the tree is going to be removed and things will begin to dry up. Let me ask you, all you professional campers, when you look for firewood, do you look for the wood that's soaking wet or do you look for the wood that's dry? Fire is coming. And if you continue to not allow the waters of God to refresh you, you will be dried up and consumed like that in judgment. Don't weep for Jesus. Weep for yourselves. Can I just tell you right now, you guys, that we live in a culture where people, they're weeping for the wrong things. I'm, here's how casual we are when it comes to certain things that ought to like alarm us. I'm at a grocery store yesterday. I won't say the name of the grocery store. But I'm checking out at the grocery store, and I see one of the courtesy clerks. You know, I was a courtesy clerk, Safeway, one of my first jobs. You know, those are the guys that bag the groceries, right? And uh, all of a sudden, I see this courtesy clerk hauling across the store, grabbing the fire extinguisher off the wall, running outside. Everyone's just inside doing their thing like, oh, what's going on? And, and, the, and the person that's at the self-checkout area casually says, oh, there's a fire on the front at the front porch area, front, front door area. I'm like how, like, how bad is this? The courtesy clerk obviously thinks there's an emergency, right? Because he's just busting the move, right? Probably hasn't run, run that intensely in like 10 years, right? He grabs a fire extinguisher, right? And they're like, oh, nothing, just a grease fire out front by the parking lot because they're cooking the ribs for, for Labor Day. Ooh, ribs sound really good. <laughs> but I'm sitting here going, there's a fire, it's a grease fire, and everyone's just kind of like going about their business like, it's nothing. And I'm like, kind of is an illustration of our culture today. Like, we think like the hills that die on have to do with politics and vaccinations and, and coronavirus and all this stuff that you guys, I think, have heard about up, at, up to this point, right? You guys are familiar with these things? And I'm going to tell you right now that while these are important conversations, they are not penultimate conversations. The most important conversation is always, where is your soul? Like so many of you, like I think when we read about Jesus sweating drops of blood, you get into such vigorous arguments with other people about non-important things when it comes to eternity that I think some of you sweat drops of blood over things that don't matter. You, you need to, we need to weep for ourselves. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right now, the journey for every earnest follower of Jesus is this. Weep for yourselves and weep for humanity. Don't weep for God. God's got this. It's like, what are you doing weeping? Don't you know I'm the winner? I'm the victor. I'm the one who accomplishes what I set out to accomplish that no man or woman could ever, ever change or prevail upon. Stop weeping for the wrong things, right? It is a wicked thing to live in a culture that calls evil good and good evil. Weep for yourselves. You cannot weep for the humanity unless you begin to weep for yourself. Weep for, weep for the things that you've chased with all your heart and you realize this does not matter for time and eternity. You need to weep for yourselves that you've spent so much time, resources, money on stuff that does not matter for time and eternity. You need to stop and be broken and realize that naked you've come into the world, naked you're going to leave, and so is the state of all of human beings. God does not want your sympathy. He wants your repentance. You don't, you, we don't know how the women responded. <laughs> Right? All of a sudden, Jesus turns on them. They're like, <laughs> they're just going home crying. Like, <laughs> we got yelled at by a guy getting crucified. <laughs> so he continues what they call the road of sorrows, the Via Della Rosa, right? And he gets to the place called the Skull, Calvary, Calvaria, which is the Latin. I don't know what it looked like, but I think it was named because this, this outcropping outside the city looked like a skull. 
And there they begin the process of crucifixion. Here's what the gospel writers don't do. They don't graphically tell you what crucifixion entailed. Matter of fact, all Luke says is, and they crucified him. That's all he says. But we do know that crucifixion was a, was a long, painful, excruciating death. That the person that was crucified would die by asphyxiation after being beaten up, and no one was perhaps beaten up as much as Jesus was. But by 9 a.m. in the morning, they were put on the cross, and by about 3 p.m., they were either dead or they hastened the process of death by breaking the criminal's legs so that they couldn't breathe anymore. So they'd take a nail through the wrist. They put their feet together, nail the two feet into the wood, and the prisoner would have slightly bent legs, right? And then with as much strength as they can muster, they press themselves up just to get their lungs open to breathe. But eventually, you, you just gave out. So six hours upon the cross. And while I can tell you about the verbal spikes put in, the verbal spikes Jesus experienced, here's creation. Men and women created in, in the image of God spewing hatred, the insults, the rulers, the mockers. Point number three, for the cruel, God is forgiving. Here's, here's what we, we witness at the scene. They are, uh, this again, a picture of humiliation, a picture of helplessness. They're, they're playing dice. They're gambling for his clothes because he's virtually naked. This is what's important for these guys, right? Mocking him. You may have heard of the seven words of the cross, but there are seven statements Jesus makes during his final moments here on earth. Here's one of them. Look at verse 30. Four. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Again, how Jesus is thinking of somebody else. Right? The rulers who crucify him, crucify him, right? Pilate says, fine, I'll do it. He's your king, puts a sign up, three languages, because Jerusalem is an international city. Everyone could read in their own language, this is the king of the Jews. The other gospels tell us that the leaders wanted Pilate to change the sign. Don't write, he's king of the Jews. Say that he claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate, because he was so disgusted with the Jewish authority, says, no, it's going to stand the way it is. You wanted this. Truth statement, king of the Jews, not only that, king of the world. King of the universe. It's amazing how much truth can come out in a really horrific situation. He is the king of the world. And yet the throne he occupies at this moment is unlike any other throne a king has ever sat on before. And not only that, he saved others. There's this word going about the country, right? For three years, this man went about and raised the dead and cleansed leprosy and, and healed the sick, right? Here's a man who saved others. Truth statement. But yet it didn't sink into their hearts as if, yeah, he saved others. It has nothing to do with me. He can't even save himself. What a, what a worthless Messiah. Look at the scene, you guys. Prophecy is being fulfilled here. You may want to write down Isaiah 53. You may want to write down Psalm 22. So much of what the Old Testament points to fulfilled in these final moments. Six hours, Jesus would remain on that cross. Excruciating pain, mocking words, mocking this with the sign, and yet there's excruciating love that's displayed. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus not only taught love your enemies, he embodied it. Matter of fact, write that phrase down, love your enemies. 
Sometimes I think we think maybe retaliation is a spiritual gift. Anyone ever mistake that once in a while? Like, we think retaliation is, is the way to get. Can I just tell you right now, when you love in the midst of, of conflict, when you love in the midst of hostility, when you love in the midst of being hated, when you love, it, it, it reflects the character of Christ. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If you've never been uh, in, in introduced into a cancel, cancel culture before, uh, it's, it's coming. Actually, we got a taste of it this week. When we as a coffee shop decide to host an event for someone who's running for governor, boy, social media lit up. And one of our customers said, hey, you guys got canceled this week. Good job. Not that you're looking to get canceled, but you, you need to realize it's, it's going to happen, right? As if, and, and let me just tell you, my first gut reaction was to retaliate. And if you think that I have the spiritual gift of retaliation, don't get Mama Bear Lori involved. <laughs> and I tell her, I'm the one who tells her, I'm like, don't, don't, even, don't even feed the fire. You know, but then my heart shifted. My heart shifted from being angry to like, these people are hurting. If you, as, as if hosting something is the same as endorsing someone. I'm not, I'm not endorsing this person, but I've created a context in which we can host all different types of people. We host all different types of groups here at Sozo. And you know what? It doesn't matter who we host. We're going to get insulted and, and, and sneered upon. You try to make everybody happy, you end up making nobody happy. Don't, don't even do it. Don't even do it. Just be who you are. And you know what? It reflects more on the person who's trying to cancel you than it does on you who are being canceled. If you can't pull up your big boy pants and women panties and, and be mature enough to exist in a room with someone who disagrees with you, that's on you. Right? If I can't stand up here and say, this is what I don't like about Donald Trump and you get your panties in a wad, that's on you. If I get up here and tell you what I don't like about Joe Biden and you get your panties in a wad, that's on you. Where has civility gone? Where has the art of dialogue gone? Unfortunately, I think it's from a petulant snowflake children who are never swat upon their butts by their parents who now think, if I can go to social media and be an armchair critic and expert and take down every business out there by my childish behavior, I'm going to do it. Well, that's on you. Because you're going to go through life and go, wah, wah, wah. I didn't get what I wanted. Wah, wah, wah. You said no to me. Wah, wah, wah. Where's the silver spoon? I can stick in my butt. Well, I only got a different place. So I'm going to stick that silver spoon. <laughs> it's not about retaliation. <laughs> but where has the civility gone? I talk a big talk. Love your enemies. Right? Social media is not the context where humanity evolves. Social media has proved that it is where humanity devolves. Because when you can sit across from somebody and say, I agree with your politics or I don't agree with your politics. I agree with your sexuality. I don't agree with your sexuality. And we can be civil about it and still at the end of the day love and respect one another. I want to create a culture where that happens. So it's on you if you leave being offended by something. It's on you. Give the benefit of the doubt to the person because they may say something offensive and they may need to retract maybe the way they, they said it. I think about that every time I give a message. I go, crap, it came out all wrong. <laughs> and now no one's going to come back because they think Scott believes this or whatever. It's like, no, no, give me the benefit of the doubt. Matter of fact, let's give each other the benefit of the doubt. And you know what? If you have an enemy, treat them to coffee, treat them to lunch, sit down and say, let me hear your thoughts. Someone once wisely said, if you got 60 minutes with somebody, listen to 55 minutes of what they have to say and then share for five minutes what's on your mind. 
There's wisdom there. These soldiers at the foot of the cross have never had a criminal pray for them. Think about the scene. Jesus is literally praying for those who are persecuting him. Can you imagine? They're sitting down, they're rolling dice, they're saying, man, this robe is really, really nice. I hope I win it, right? And all of a sudden, they all stop and they're like, dude, he's praying for us. We, I was the one who put that crown of thorns into his head. I was the one that blindfolded him and struck him and said, hey, who is it that hit you? Let's play the prophecy game, right? These are the men who beat him to a bloody pulp. And yet, what does Jesus do? He's praying for them thinking of others more than himself. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And if you think for a minute you can't do that, and you've got the power of God residing in you, the issue isn't that you can't. The issue is that you won't. Life is too short to go through licking your desire to retaliate and be hostile and be violent. And I love what Frederick Buechner, one of my favorite writers, said this. Bitterness is the poison you drink hoping the other person dies. Soldiers are sitting there. We know at least one soldier from another gospel is like, wow, I've never seen anyone treat us like this. See, Jesus is a prophet to the women. I don't want your sympathy, I want your repentance. He's a priest to the soldiers and the rulers. Right? I'm praying for you. But then he shows up as king with the criminals. Here's the last point. For the criminals, paradise is offered. This is, this is remarkable. I love this, right? So here it is during the most defining moment of God's work in human history. Christ walks on stage with two random unnamed criminals because that's what the greatest moment's all about. And yet what we see on Calvary this day is a microcosm of human history. Three crosses. In your notes, you have the cross of rejection. You've got the cross of redemption. You've got the cross of repentance. And Jesus is the line of demarcation between the two. He's in the middle. Obviously, Jesus is the cross of redemption. But what you do with Christ, because there's only one of two choices. This is how simple the gospel message is. You either reject it or you are repentant and broken because of it. Look at, look at the conversation. Perhaps the greatest display of faith ever in human history takes place by a guy who we don't even know his name. We just know him by criminal number two. He displays something remarkable, and I want us just to kind of look through this real quick. These are the, this is the second of the seven last words of Jesus. Luke only contains three of the phrases. But what does he say to the thief? Today you shall be with me in paradise. Which, let me just say this right out of the gate. This means two things. Number one, there is no intermediate state between this world and the next. There's no purgatory. There's no soul sleep. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Last breath here, first breath with Jesus in eternity. Woohoo! So, first and foremost, there's no intermediate state. Secondly, Jesus did not go to hell. There are these things called creeds that we 
sometimes recite Lutheran church, Catholic church, some church context where, and on the third, you know, he descended into hell for three days or whatever the, what does Jesus say? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. There's no, hey, I'll be there in a minute. I got a little side trip I need to do. Jesus did not go to hell. His spirit immediately went to paradise. I need to put that out there. But let's talk about what, really what's important here. The three crosses. First cross, rejection. The one thief is like so many people. Because look what he says. Look at verse 40, 39. If you're not, if you are the Christ, right, save yourself and us. We need to get rescued right now. If you're the getaway car, let's get that engine humming. Let's get, it, let's get out of here, right? Here was the chief concern of the first thief, the first criminal. Save my skin. I'm going to tell you right now, too many people come to God because they want to save their own skin. If you don't come to God with a save your soul cry, save your skin doesn't get you anywhere. Write that down. You come to God because you want him to save your skin or you come to God because you want him to save your soul. The thief demonstrates for us on the cross called rejection that it is only a matter of convenience to him. Not conviction. Convenience, right? I'll take anybody as king who's willing to rescue me right now. Because once I'm down, I'm just going to go live my life. I might give you a high five, might give you a tip, maybe take you out to coffee. Say thank you, but you know what? I'm just going to look to save my high. This is, this is what we call carjack theology. Everyone in their car has a carjack. Here's what I know about your carjack and mine. You don't take it out every day and go, I'm just so thankful you're in, in the back of my car. I'm just so thankful you're here. You know what it is? It's a dirty, greasy thing that only comes out during a time of emergency when you got to jack your car up. You use it, save your car, your tire, get back on the road, put it back, forget about it. Right? You let it do the dirty work, you put it away again. You're such a good car, Jack. We do the same thing with God, don't we? You know what? God, you're there to jack me up out of sickness. You're, you're there to jack me up out of a financial mess. You're there to jack me up out of a lousy job. You're there to, to jack me up out of this crummy marriage. You know what? You're just there when I need you, and I just put you away when I don't. You don't come to God because he's useful. You come to God because he's beautiful. Is your God useful or is your God beautiful? That's, that's the thief on the cross of reje rejection. There's no spirit of brokenness. There's no spirit of guilt. There's no sense of penitence. There's no humility. It's the, is it Jan Jackson or Jody Watley? What have you done for me lately mentality? Are you more concerned about God saving your skin or are you more concerned about God saving your soul? Well, there's a cross of redemption number two, right? Which is the center and we've been talking about that, so we don't need to spend time on that. But this is, this is, this is the, the boundary, right? The cross. It's either rejection or third, re repentance. Look at the, the third thief. While so many of Jesus' disciples had abandoned him because they believed that he was not the true Messiah, right? Their image of the king in the kingdom wasn't, wasn't playing out the way they had scripted it. This criminal, let me just tell you, here's the faith. This criminal believed that a crucified man beside him had a kingdom. Look what he says. Look at verse 40, 41, right? 43, 42. 
remember me when you come into your kingdom. Like, is he hallucinating? Is he just delusional? Yet he recognizes something about Christ. He started today by mocking him and insulting him just like the others. But something happened. Maybe he was hearing Jesus pray for his enemies. Maybe it was just the countenance. Maybe it was just the spirit. Whatever it was, this thief is looking at Christ going, this guy's the real deal. And he says to him, you've got a kingdom. Remember me. Right? This guy has no hope. This is, this is the beauty of the gospel, right? It takes the most hopeless situation. You are on a cross ready to die within hours. And it offers the opposite. Life. Look at the sequence of events that happens here. Number one, he rebukes his friend. He says, stop the insulting to his buddy. Many believe that these are two guys that were associated with Barabbas. Their buddy, you know, remember, their, Barabbas was going to be crucified. Here's the three guys getting crucified this day. Barabbas is set free. Jesus gets Barabbas his spot. These two guys were perhaps accomplices with Barabbas. And all of a sudden, the one thief rebukes the other and says, stop. Right? Number two, he fears God. Look at verse 40. He rebukes his friend, do you not even fear God? So there's a moment of conviction, right? Remember, the friend's all about convenience. Get me off the cross. I just want to get rescued. The, the second thief is about conviction. He rebukes his friend, and he says, do you not fear God? Think about how weighty this phrase is. Look at verse 40. He doesn't ask to be taken down from the cross. Notice this. He doesn't ask to be taken down from the cross. I'm sure he would have been totally happy if Jesus had offered it. He doesn't. But all that he is concerned about is being right with God. Perhaps he grew up in a religious environment where he was taught to fear God. And maybe all those lessons that mom and dad, his community had taught him, were, were, were bubbling to the surface. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This thief realizes, and don't miss this, this thief realizes that he needs not a change in his circumstances, but a change in which his life has been centered on up to this moment. You know, when you fear God, you guys, you're not asking him, and I'm not saying it's wrong to ask him, you're not asking him to bail you out of situations and hard, hard moments. You're asking, most importantly, that God would be revered in your heart as you go through the difficult seasons. That's what fearing God means. If, if your God is just a God who you're going to come to to rescue you, you don't fear him. This is not about a change in circumstances. This is about a heart that's centered on the right thing. And he says this, don't change my circumstances. Change the focus of my heart. That's what he means there. You know why I can say that with, with confidence? Look at the third thing that happens. He owns up to his sin. He realizes he has nothing to hide anymore. This is, this is the problem right now, even in our world today. Everyone's got this facade. I'm good. I got this. Thank you, Lord, but no thanks. Right? This guy owns up to his own sin. He had no desire to save face anymore. He had no more will to assert himself. He was here. He's laid open before God, and there's no way to hide his guilt anymore. And you cannot come to a place like that without God acting on your life. You want to know how this man is evidencing God's work? He is being open about his own junk. 
And fourth, he accepts the punishment he knows he deserves. Notice what he says. We deserve what we're getting for our deeds. You know what we call that? The spirit is undeserving. Can I tell you, as, as I've walked with God for 36 years, that, that, that spirit of undeservedness just has stayed with me. Because the moment you think you deserve the gospel, the moment you think you're entitled to the gospel, is the moment you are not even aware of the gospel. He's undeserving before God. He openly confesses, number five, Jesus' is innocence. This man hasn't done anything. He's acknowledging Jesus' righteousness. He's saying this man is innocent. This man is spotless. This man is blameless. We are getting what we deserve. He doesn't deserve this. So there's awareness of who Jesus is. Number six, he recognizes Jesus' power and acknowledges him as king. Something is, is breaking into this man's life that he's saying, this man is who he says he is. He's a king, and I just hope that when he enters this kingdom, he remembers me. Which is number seven. That's his prayer, his plea. He's calling out. This, he's praying. Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And number eight, he humbled himself so much to ask Jesus for this. This is... This is remarkable. Let me, let's just stop. As we land the plane this morning, let me, let's just stop. When you think about it, this guy has the craziest request. Right? I know you're the perfect Lord from heaven, but whenever you get to wherever you're going, whatever reward you're going to come into, will you stop and remember a guy you knew for about 30 minutes on a cross who had done nothing worthy in his life and yet was being executed with, for murder and, and treason? What a crazy request, right? Here's a guy who's believing in a kingdom he cannot see, a king wearing a crown of thorns, whose throne is a cross, whose robe is nakedness, whose glory is a body shredded by Roman whips, whose court consists of blasphemers and whose enemies have apparently conquered him. And what's even crazier is that God grants him his request. Don't miss this. Jesus delights in knowing that you are going to be taken care of. Today, you will be with me in paradise. I wish I, what was the, what was the look on that guy's face? Did he just start sobbing? Did he just decide to give, give up at that moment? Like, I cannot breathe, and if, if paradise is offered to me, I'm ready to, I'm ready to, Stamp my bill. I'm out of here. But notice, you guys, and this is so key, that the reward is not heaven. The reward is union with Jesus. You take out the with me from that verse, you've got nothing. You know what heaven is without Jesus? Hell. Hell. You're not going to a place where you're expecting utopia. You're not going to a place where, oh, can't wait to see those streets. They just seem so beautiful. The trees, the foliage, whatever. If your desire is anything but being united with Christ, your desires are weak. Today, you will be with me. I know some of you are probably sitting there going, how's it fair that this guy who's lived an entire life as a criminal and then in his final moments gets to go to heaven when I, my entire life, have been following Jesus? You ever, you ever heard of these conversations before? We call them deathbed conversions. I've been a part of deathbed conversions. Matthew chapter 20, write it down, read it later. 
the good news is Jesus taught on this subject. The parable of the vineyard owner who goes and hires people throughout the day. 6 a.m., I need some workers. Okay, I'll come work. Man, 9 a.m., I need more workers. And he hires someone at 4 p.m., 5 p.m., right? End of the day. Only, a, only an hour or two of work, work left. And at the end of the day, you know what the vineyard owner does? He pays everyone the same amount. And the people who were there since 6 a.m. were like, what are you doing? He says, I'm the owner of the vineyard. Do I not have the right to pay everyone what I would like to pay them? And all of a sudden, everyone's humbled. Because this is grace. It's not fairness. It's grace. Fairness is getting what you do deserve. And what do you deserve? Hell. Grace says, I'll take care of hell for you and give you relationship with me. You're good. Praise God for the men and women who have known God all their lives. And praise God for the men and women who on their deathbeds are broken and that are even now rejoicing at the feet of God in heaven. That's grace. That's grace. What a scene. We'll continue next week as we look at Jesus' final moments on the cross and his burial. But may we never, ever presume upon God's kindness when we consider the things we've talked about today. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thanks for today. The message of the cross, the message of what Jesus endured for us, I pray would never, ever lose its impact. Lord, we're, we're uh, reminded of such incredible things today. Perhaps we've heard things we've never heard before. Lord, my prayer is that this, the, the, the account that you've given to us is meant to stir our hearts and minds, and, and it's to stir them so that we become more worshipful of who you are and what you've done for us. Without you, we are empty. Without you, we are lost. Without you, we are helpless. But because of your kindness toward us, that while we're yet sinners, Christ dies for us, we are now men and women of hope. We have a destiny. We have now intimacy with you. Thank you that we are with Jesus and not without. And thank you that our union with Jesus is not only able to be experienced now, but it will be experienced forever, and we are looking forward to that. Thank you, Lord, for being so close to us, for navigating the difficulties in our lives and being a God who's promised us never to leave us or forsake us. Be glorified in our lives. Things said and done, you deserve the glory. Thank you for the riches we have in Christ Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. Love you.